What's good, y'all? Welcome back to Believe in Mommy. He brought you by Believe Network. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Donato, coming to you live today from the childhood home down here in beautiful Miami. Well, okay, it's not technically Miami. I grew up in Broward, but I'll still claim Miami. Uh, and if you don't care about that, feel free to skip ahead because timestamps are down below on both the podcast audio only side and the YouTube side with the video. Now, if you're on the YouTube side, well, I always got to show it off. You see up here, we got the big three poster with Hassan Whiteside covering up LeBron James because, yes, that's how I used to roll as a kid. Uh, we also got the signed D-Wade picture. We got me with UD over there. Uh, so pretty pretty neat little setup here, uh, although it's not as good as what I usually work with. Uh, you can see I'm holding the mic today. I don't got my mic stand, uh, so we'll do a bit of a hand job today. Well, oh, pause on that. Point is, are we making it work because... As you, as you all know, the Miami Heat had a historic win yesterday. And I'm not going to lie to y'all Heat fans. I did not get to see it. So I'm back home uh, for Easter. Obviously, it's Easter Sunday tomorrow. So if anyone's watching this on Easter Sunday, happy Easter, everyone. And uh, I'll actually be here for the next few days, taking a few days off work just to hang out with the family over here. So I might have another video over here. We'll see how much I got time for while I'm on vacation. Uh, but... Uh, I didn't get to see the game last night because usually when I'm back in town, uh, me and the boys, we, you know, that I went to high school with, we rent out a gym and we play uh, some full court, right? Uh, and just so happens, yesterday we we got a, the gym time from eight to ten, uh, and we were playing during the heat game. Now we were keeping up with the score, best believe, uh, mostly because yesterday was rough, and we lost quite a bit yesterday. I played not good at all, which is which is rare because usually when we be going to that gym, we be hooping. Uh, but it was a bit of a rough day yesterday. I guess we gave most of our powers to the Miami Heat, who absolutely lit it up yesterday. Uh, and I got a couple highlights. I mean, probably my best one is this Hame Hotkez type post up, face up, step through. I told y'all I got a foot fetish for the footwork. And again, if y'all on the audio side, come over to the YouTube side. I'm showing these clips. Uh, just search Anthony DiNardo and subscribe while you're over here because I'm on the grind to 5,000 subs, we had about 3.7K right now. But uh, the rest of my highlights were either wide open threes, which is whatever, you know, I'm supposed to hit that, uh, or this one right here in which it was a nice looking three, but my wrist curled sideways. Like my follow through was all the way to the left. The ball was kind of slippery. I don't know. It was windy inside. Whatever other excuse I can make. Uh, point is, uh, yesterday was a rough day for all of us. But I mean, everyone kind of, everyone on my team was kind of ass. And do y'all ever play pickup and like you play bad and you low key kind of hoop for your other you, you you low key hope for your other teammates to be bad as well so all the blame isn't on you. I'm not saying that's what I do because you know at the end of the day I'm a winner. I want to win. Uh, but yeah, yesterday was was terrible. So if they point fingers at me, I could point them right back. Anyways, during that I told y'all the Miami Heat were busting the Portland Trail Blazers ass which good because I hate that sorry ass team I hate that sorry ass franchise and I hate Joe Cronin y'all know I got the Joe Cronin this track I only get to play it a couple times a year now I played it last time the Heat won in Portland so we're gonna play it again at the end of this episode don't you worry and if you have not heard my Joe Cronin diss track make sure to stick around to the end because it is a thing of beauty uh, but yeah, obviously I did watch the highlights from yesterday's game. Uh, obviously I keep up with it pretty well through Twitter. Uh, and a couple of things stood out to me. One, uh, pretty much the, well, there's two negatives. Nikola Jovic did get hurt. He had a bit of a knee contusion, but Ira Winderman said it's nothing serious. Uh, the other thing I noticed is Jimmy Butler had eight points. Uh, and selfishly that hurts because <laughs> I had an easy parlay trying to stack my bread up easily. I had Jimmy Butler for 10 points, alternate 10 points. The man had eight. They scored 120 something points. Jimmy Butler had eight points. But outside of that, we don't we don't care about that. Hayward Highsmith continues to be hooping. The man had the nastiest step back three you'll ever see. Looking like James Harden, regular season James Harden. Because we know playoff James Harden is a bum. Uh, but Hayward Highsmith was hooping, continues a, a great run of shooting. Uh, low-key, though, he did travel on that step back. Not to rain on his parade, but uh, low-key kind of traveled. Uh, I wanted to pull up Highsmith's stats here, too, because I feel like he's having a really great season. Coming into the season, I was not a believer. A lot of Heat fans liked him. They liked his defensive versatility. I was always kind of a guy that said uh, he – I've never heard the phrase great defense, better offense more than he when he was guarding someone. 
because I felt like he was clamping up. I felt like he was rotating, sliding laterally pretty well, but I still felt like he was getting scored on all the time. Uh, but I did publicly state my conversion into a Highsmith believer earlier this season because I started to see the vision. You know, defensively and offensively, I really liked what he had going on. And he did have some rough stretches, you know, earlier in the season shooting. Uh, but in totality, he's averaging, uh, he's played 57 games uh, at uh, how many minutes? 20 minutes a night. And his averages are six points per game, three rebounds, whatever. Uh, but if you look at the shooting percentage, 46% from the field and 41% from three. If you can get 41% from three from Hayward Highsmith, that is a guy that is a legitimate rotation piece in the NBA. Now, come playoff time, if everyone on the Heat gets healthy, I don't know if he'll be in a rotation. You know, I don't want to get too much into that because we've talked about it a ton. But if you got the normal starters with Duncan off the bench, you got what? Tyler, Kevin Love, Kayla Lamar, and Hamid Hotkins. That's nine right there. And I don't think Spolster will go more than nine deep in the playoffs, but... We'll see. Point is, I think there will be times for Hayward Highsmith to get some run. Uh, and if he keeps playing like he has been this season, uh, he's a guy that I do trust in the playoffs. Uh, we've seen him have some success guarding Jason Tatum, too. So maybe he's a guy that you use uh, matchup wise if you were to face the Boston Celtics. Uh, but if you go for Hayward Highsmith's last three games, he is wow. Uh, basketball reference is usually when you when you. Uh, click on it. It's supposed to show me he's glitching out right now. Uh, but quick mats here. Uh, he's 12 of his last 13 from three. Wow. Uh, not saying he's going to keep that up, but uh, it's been nice to see Hayward Highsmith stepping in the Duncan Robinson role while Duncan Robinson has been out. Speaking of three point shooters, we saw Bam Adebayo yesterday continue his stretch of shooting from three. He was two of three yesterday. Both beautiful catch and shoots, no hesitation, like directly in the flow of the offense. Uh, this season, Bam Adebayo is actually up to 36% from three uh, because he was at like 18 or something earlier but again it was a, on a couple attempts uh and they asked bam about this like why s did he just so randomly start taking threes uh and it sounded like he was joking but i think he was kind of being serious he said one day i just woke up and it felt like shooting threes and th that's that's what happened literally I, I can't explain it this this is what we've all been dreaming of Right. But we all kind of pictured that it would happen like after a long off season, Bam would come into a, you know, a new season, take a few to first game. We say, OK, this is the year. That's kind of how I remember it with Chris Bosh. Right. Because earlier in his heat tenure, he wasn't a three point shooter. But of course, by the end of it, he was a knockdown sniper. But if you go back, Bam uh, shot his first three, you know, in the stretch, it was uh, against the Nuggets on March 13th. So about a two, two to three weeks ago. Uh, and since then, he's taken at least one three every game. Uh, and in that stretch, let me see if I can get basketball reference to work here. In that stretch, so how many games is that? That's one, two, three, four. That's the last seven games for Bam and Bow. He's shooting two threes a game at 62%. That is not sustainable. I understand. But I mean, maybe if he's only taking one to two a game and they're both wide open, maybe he could be in the high 40s. You know, you're not talking about a guy that's ever going to be high volume, but the fact that he is taking one to two even last night took three a game that will do incredible things for the spacing on this team if they again i mean you guys are smart you, you're watching the channel that means you're smart if he's taking the threes the defense has to come out there because he's now a threat and that is so much more space for everyone for guys like Jimmy to cut back door and Jovic and Hame, those guys love doing that. Even Duncan Robinson. And we know Bam is an amazing passer to find those guys in that, that little pocket pass, that bounce pass the guys roll into the rim. Or even for Bam itself, the spacing allows him to use his athleticism to blow past defenders, get to the rim. Maybe pump fake, now pull up to his, uh, you know, do a dribble pull up in his beautiful mid-range spot there. That This development in his game, I don't want to make it seem like it's going to change the world or anything like that but i think it is critical like i don't think it can be understated how important this is if bam at can continue to keep this up especially for a team that has been struggling offensively this i think is very important not to mention we know they're very small and we know we have they or we have bam play to five because you usually need to stretch four because jimmy's not a great three-point shooter i know his percentages are good this year as well and bam wasn't really a threat from out there so you had to play a four that could shoot, you know, whether it was Yovich, kind of how they're doing now. But if Bam can now space the floor, 
you can play him potentially with the guy who's actually big. Maybe we see some minutes with Orlando Robinson if, if they're going against the Boston Celtics and they're getting killed on the glass. Maybe you can go out in the offseason and get someone who's actually big and can rebound. I, I don't know who off the top of my head. There's, there's not many of those big guys, great rebounders left that are actually decent players, you know, that who aren't zero on offenses. But maybe they can get someone like a Yaka Pirtle, for example. I think he might have signed an extension or something, but that's a guy that's very big, very good rebounder. I've kind of wanted him in the past, but I've been hesitant because he can't space the floor. And you can't have three non-spacers, you know, in a starting lineup if you were to start Jovic. But uh, I don't want to get too ahead of, uh, ahead of myself here with the band three-point shooting stuff because it's still early. And again, it's not world-changing. Now, if Bam can get to the point where he's a Chris Bosh level three-point shooter, well, now you're talking about who, who uh, you're talking about a guy who could win the MVP the whole damn league because he is the best defender in the entire NBA. I don't care what anyone says. Now, the only guy that I might give some credit to is Victor Wembanyama. That boy had 40 and 20 last night. He's averaging about damn near four blocks a game. I think he's actually at like two and a half a game. But on any given night, he gets you four to five blocks. That dude is sensational. He's a guy that could legitimately win MVP next year. Not to not to overreact, but. And y'all see, y'all see what he doing? Wait till that Spurs team gets a point guard. Uh, but yeah, Bam Adebayo, we know he's always going to be one of the top three defenders in the entire NBA. He's already averaging over 20 points per game. Once he gets that three-point shot down, continues to work on his post footwork, which I do think has gotten better this season as well. You're talking about a guy that could be the best defender and a 25, 26, 27 point per game score one day, uh, especially as Jimmy Butler, maybe two two years from now, uh, starts to give the reins up uh, a little bit more on the offensive end. Because I don't know how many good seasons of Jimmy we have left. Uh, I think I think it was last year I said we get, the beginning of last year I said, I'm confident saying we get at least two more Jim VP seasons. Obviously, last year, Jimmy was great come postseason. And this year, I believe Jimmy will be great come the, the playoffs as well. Because we've seen Jimmy have his stretches this season where he's been uh, good, you know. Uh, or that Jim VP, it's pretty clear he's saving himself for the playoffs. Uh, we can talk a little bit about Jimmy as well because he started quite a bit of controversy this week uh, with regards to him being at, I think it was the U.S. Open, the tennis match. A lot of Heat fans were mad because he missed the last game. You got killed by the Warriors because he was sick. Uh, but to be honest, I, I get that. I, I don't want to give Jimmy Butler a pass because he's getting paid a ton of money and he takes days off. And when you're already struggling to make the playoffs, right? Because they're in the playing now. And whenever you're in the playing tournament, you could miss the playoffs, right? Uh, and whenever you're getting, like I said, a guy getting paid that much money, you want him to come and perform every single night. You don't really see LeBron take nights off and he's 40. I know he's missed some games recently, but let's even say when LeBron was Jimmy's age, that man was going 100% every single possession of every single game. You know, that's what you want your star players to do. The only reason I don't like to get on Jimmy too much for that is because every year come postseason, man, this guy is a top five player in the game. One of, one of the best in the entire world. And if he needs to take rest in the regular season to perform like that in the playoffs, it's hard for me to get on him for that. It really is. Because you got too many playoff bums like Paul George and James Harden and Joel Embiid who shrink when the moment comes big. And every year, Jimmy Butler is that guy. And a lot of times I'll say that and people say, well, okay, last year he was great versus uh, the, the Bucks, And then he didn't really do anything after that. Had a bad final series. And he did. But to me, that was the outlier. And who knows? Maybe it's because Josh Hart rolled up into his ankle. He really wasn't the same since. Other than that, you know, one quarter he got into it with Grant uh, Grant Williams in the Eastern Conference Finals. But I don't know if that's true, so I don't want to use that as an excuse. But to me, that's the outlier. If you look at Jimmy Butler's playoff numbers every single year since joining the Miami Heat, they are sensational and drastically improved from his regular season. You know, whether it was the finals in the Lakers, right? That was one of the most amazing performances I have ever seen with my own two eyes. So let's not act like Jimmy Butler shrinks when the moment becomes that big because he did it in the NBA Finals before. We saw him do it in the Eastern Conference Finals two years ago, going into Boston Game 6 down 3-2, to two, pulled off just like LeBron did back in 2013. We saw Jimmy Butler do that last year. So I think last year going into the Finals, that was a bit of an outlier. Maybe it was an ankle, but we got to see how this season plays out. Uh, if we go into this postseason and Jimmy Butler is ass in the playoffs, well, then okay. I'll say in hindsight, you know what? I should have been mad that he was at the U.S. Open getting sick. 
when maybe he could have played, you could have been, you know, a fifth seed instead of an eighth seed and maybe had an easier matchup in the first round uh, and, you know, to help yourself. So by the time you get to the finals, your body's not all worn out from going through the gauntlet to get there. But I'm willing to give Jimmy Butler the rest of the season before I truly, truly criticize him. Uh, anyways, let's talk about the Miami Heat in general, man. Uh, they are the most inconsistent bipolar team ever. Uh, I think in my last video or my last post game reaction, which was against during the Warriors, I said if I could pick one word to describe the Miami Heat, it would be unserious. I think I will continue to use that word. Uh, I actually ended that video versus the Warriors saying uh, the way this season has been a roller coaster. That game was a down. I said smash the money line on the Heat next game because they're gonna win by forty. Little did I know they'd win by 60. But let's go back to last week here, right? You lost to the New Orleans Pelicans at home. The Pelicans didn't have Brandon Ingram. Terrible loss. You scored like 90 points or something. Uh, the Pelicans won by 23. Going into the next game back in Miami, you played the Cleveland Cavaliers, who had no Donovan Mitchell. I understand. Uh, I think Jimmy Butler played that game. I forget if he played or not. I know he missed the Warriors game. But anyways, you won by 37 points. That game was never close. And then you go into the next game, that's when you play the Warriors. That team has been playing terrible. Well, they've won like three straight, but we know they're very close to falling out of the plan. The Rockets are right on their ass. Warriors about to be that 11 seed and miss it all completely, right? And we just know that team in general is not, is not great. They're not having a great season. They killed you. you won, they won by 21. The score wasn't even close. So going back, lost by Pelicans to 23, beat the Cavs by 37, lost to the Warriors by 21. And then you play the Portland Trailblazers one by 60. What kind of team has that inconsistency? And, I mean, you could say it's a little concerning because the two best teams there in that stretch, the Warriors and the Pelicans, those are the ones you lost. And then you beat the two good teams, or the two bad teams, I mean, because uh, the Cavs were Mitch and Donovan Mitchell. So they're not great without Donovan. But I, I don't want to nitpick like that. Although I did have a video earlier this year. The Heat are like 3 and, what, like 3 and 12 versus the top seven teams in the league, something like that. Uh, so they're they're kind of beating up on bad teams and not beating the good teams, which are the teams you're seeing in the playoffs. So you might want to get concerned, but I don't value the regular season that much. We see all the time the playoffs is like a completely different game than the regular season. The one I kind of go back to, which is like 10 years ago now, I know, but I remember all Heat fans were freaking out Back when the Brooklyn Nets had KG and Paul Pierce, they swept the season series versus the Heat. We matched up versus them in the playoffs and bust their ass in five games. And I just said, relax. The great teams know to pace themselves. And I think that's what the Miami Heat are doing because I, I get it. <laughs> They're playing it really close here, but I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt because you've had four full, like full played out runs in the Jimmy Butler era. And the only one that did not have a deep playoff run was when you had a seven-week offseason and they got swept by the Bucks, obviously, the following year, the, the Bryn Forbes series. Sorry, trigger warning, Bryn Forbes, Heat fans. But that, I think, was a legitimate fluke season. Because if you go back the last year in the bubble, the last four teams standing was the Lakers, Nuggets, Celtics, Heat. All those teams had a very short offseason, historically short offseason, and they all lost in the first round the next year. And then you go back two years later, which was last year. Who was the last four teams standing? Once again, the Lakers, Nuggets, Celtics, Heat. So people say the bubble was a fluke. The bubble was not a fluke because those same four teams were the last four teams standing last year. And where have the Bucks been? They lost in the second round in the bubble. They lost in the first round last year. That's what it does. That 2021 season was the fluke year. The Suns versus Bucks year. Not the year before. Uh... And that's why, excluding that year, I'm willing to give this Heat team the benefit of the doubt. Because in the three years we've seen outside of the, the fluke season, you got an NBA Finals run, you got an Eastern Conference Game 7 run, Jimmy Butler, one shot away from the Finals, and then you got another NBA Finals run. So as bad as this team plays at times, as bad as they look on paper compared to the Bucks and the Celtics and the Knicks, even the Cavs went healthy, they've personally shown me enough to say, you know what? I'm going to let it play through because I'll be the first one to tell you that don't got a backup point guard, don't have any size that I trust, you know, a backup big that I trust can't stay healthy, too, uh, too uh, turnover prone at times, not a good enough shooting. 
un unreliable when it comes to you know the injuries of your leading scorer Tyler Hero, right? But I will still after saying all of that, I will give them benefit of the doubt just because that's what they've shown me, right? And even on paper, I think this Heat team is better than they were last year. I know they're not playing like it, but I mean, if you want to talk alone about the improvement of Terry Rozier to Kyle Lowry, that's that's night and day. I mean, that's the widest margin of wide margins. Kyle Lowry is ass, even though he had like 23 points yesterday. And every time I say that, I get Raptors fans in my comments saying, oh, how dare you disrespect one of the greatest players in our franchise? Man, I don't give a I don't give a damn about the Toronto Raptors. Get out of here with that BS. He was good for y'all. He was ass for the Heat. There's no two ways about it. OK, uh, and Terry was there, although he's he hasn't shot great a lot of games. What he provides offensively is just is, is very important to what this Heat team needs, especially if you don't know if Tyler Hero is going to be in or out of the lineup. And, you know, even if Terry was there is not shooting well at the very least. Well, his defense has been decent, too. But I was going to say at the very least, he is a low turnover guy, oftentimes with high assists. You know, we'll see him get, you know, a lot of games with four or five assists and zero turnovers. Uh, but even the games with one or two turn uh, one or two assists, he's not turning the ball over. And he's always a threat to score, which again, whether he's hitting her shots or not, he keeps the defense honest. And you have to put one of your best perimeter defenders on Terry Rozier because he's very shifty. He's very quick. He can get to the rim. He can shoot threes. Uh, so I think just having a guy who's a threat is very, very important. Because Kyle Lowry was not putting that kind of pressure on the defense. He was putting zero rim pressure on the defense. You want to talk about driving kicks? Well, he couldn't drive. So they couldn't take out, uh, kick out to the shooters. And that's something with Terry Rozier they could do. Uh, you also got Nikola Jovic, who, again, he has been hurt here. Uh, or he was hurt yesterday. Hopefully he's not serious. But he's played very well of late. You got Jaime Jaquez, who will, will finish probably top five in rookie of the year. Uh, I wanted to talk about Jaime Jaquez for a little bit, too. Uh, a lot of talk about him hitting the rookie wall. Uh, I listened to him on JJ Reddick's podcast, and he kind of said that his decrease in production has been a mix of his groin injury and also the inconsistent role, which I understand because you've had Jimmy Butler in and out, and that means Jaime Hawkins is in and out of the starting lineup. You've had Duncan Robinson in and out, so that means they need more scoring from Jaime Hawkins or, diff or different roles, you know. And I talked about this in my last video, too, so I don't want to get into it too much. But when you have a guy that's, one, coming back from injury, a rookie at that, and then his role is being constantly changed almost on a nightly basis because of the injuries, I could see why it'd be hard for him to get into a rhythm. On the season as a whole, he's at uh, 12 points per game on 49% from the field, which is great, and then 31% from three, which is not great. Uh, but I kind of want to pull up his stats here pre- and post-injury. Uh, so before the injury, Jaime Jaquez was averaging, and I really just care about the percentages uh, because his role, you know, and how many shots he get will differ based off who's healthy. Uh, but pre-injury, it was uh, 39 games. Jaime Jaquez was averaging 14 points a night on 35% shooting from three, uh, which I think is pretty decent. 35% shooting from three uh, is something that I would be happy with, with Jaime Jaquez. And then if you go post-injury, uh, Jaime Jaquez is at... 10 points per game so four points per game less and he's at 24 percent from three so an 11 point drop off from three uh and i didn't say his his field goal before was 51 percent, and now he's at 43 percent. so essentially you know double digit drops in percentage pre and post injury uh but whether this is a rookie wall for not or just a a large slump for Jaime Jaquez, he has personally shown me enough for me to believe that he's going to be a very, very good player going forward. Whether he plays ass the rest of the season or great the rest of the season, he's a guy that I have faith in going forward. So uh, I do want to talk about the injuries a little more also because we talked about how the Heat are so bipolar. It's likely that injuries are the reason why. Uh, they have 34 different starting lineups. Out of the 73 games they played, that means 46%, so almost half of the games they've played, they've had a different starting lineup, which is just insane. Uh, and I know people were happy yesterday. They said they won. The Heat are starting to get healthy. They really didn't get anyone back other than Jimmy Butler from his one-game absence because he was sick. Because Kevin Love was cleared to play, yeah, but he didn't. Uh, and Spolster kind of said that he wants to give him some more time to get adjusted, I guess, but... Then he didn't play him at all, so I didn't exactly understand that. Uh, but it is important to note uh, that uh, Spoh said Kevin Love was actually healthy enough to play the last two games, uh, but he uh, was dealing with some personal issues. So 
Hopefully everything going on with Kevin Love is, is decent there. Uh, and I do look for him to get a little bit of run, uh, you know, maybe increase playing time each game over the next week or two to kind of get him ready for the playoffs because he is a guy that they will need in the postseason. Uh, I don't care if Thomas Bryant had, what, 26 points yesterday. They need Kevin Love to be their backup center. Uh, and Duncan Robinson, they've set his day today, but then he got sent back on my, sent back to Miami when they were on the road trip to see a back specialist. He's been questionable every day. You haven't heard any updates. My last video was about Tyler Hero uh, and his injury, so go check that out. But you had Sham saying there's no timetable for return. You had Tyler Hero calling cap. But yet, I haven't heard nothing about Tyler Hero. We heard that he was supposed to get reevaluated yesterday, right? Because that was two weeks after he got that plasma injection in his foot, right? Or platelet injection. We said he'd get reevaluated in two weeks, which was yesterday. I didn't hear nothing. They said you're supposed to start ramping up and start playing again within that two to three week range. So, well, now we're in week three. Let's see if Tyler Hero starts to play. And then if we get a timetable, because as of right now, Shams is right. There is no timetable for Tyler Hero's return. Now, if we go another week, that'll put us at April 5th. That's when they start their last road trip of the season. Uh, and that kind of gives them, what, four or five games before the playoffs. Not a ton of time to get used to the team and get some rust off, but it's better than nothing. Because the last thing I want is for Tyler Hero to miss the rest of the regular season and then be ready come postseason. Well, no, that's not the last thing I want because I want Tyler Hero to return, but I would like him to get some run prior to the playoffs. Because especially, not even just to get the rust off, but especially to get, you know, adjusted to playing with Terry Rozier because they only got a few games together and it didn't work great, obviously, because they have some, some pretty similar skill sets. But anyways, I feel pretty good, man. You beat the Portland Trailblazers by 60. Uh, unfortunately, I missed it. The biggest win in Heat history, of course. I had to miss it to sh to, to play terrible yesterday. Uh, but yeah, Joe Cronin is not looking good, man. If you look at that package that he got for Dame, he got DeAndre Ayton, who dominating. Yeah, right. That dude's a bum. He's been playing better of late, I know. Uh, but they would have got him anyways, by the way. That was the third, like a separate deal with the Suns. Now, the Suns did get Grayson Allen from the Bucks. Instead, if it was with the Heat, they probably would have got Caleb Martin. I think Caleb Martin's a better player, but Grayson Allen's having a hell of a season. So, But regardless, DeAndre Ayton still would have went to the Blazers. They also got Tumani Kamara, who is, is shooting like 30% from three this year, seven points a game. He's not doing much, uh, but I've heard some people say he's got some potential. Uh, and then obviously they got uh, Drew Holiday, who they flipped for two more first-round picks. So they got three first-round picks total, Malcolm Brogdon and Robert Williams. Obviously, uh, Robert Williams hasn't played this year, can't stay healthy, probably won't play much next year either. And then they got Malcolm Brogdon, who's a good player, he's shooting like 40% from three this year, uh, 15 points a night. He's played, But he's played 39 games this year. Uh, he's a guy that can't stay healthy anyways. And he's, how old is he? He's 31 years old. So he's not part of their future anyway. So looking back at the Blazers, I don't know how Joe Cronin has a job because you could have had Nikola Jovic, who looks like he's going to be an absolute star in this league. You could have had Jame Hakes, who I say the same thing about. Uh, and then Dame could have been happy. But no, he wanted to be all petty. So anyways, that's all I got to say for this video. Make sure to like and subscribe if you're on the YouTube side. If you're on the podcast side, come over to the YouTube and like and subscribe. And also leave five stars if you're over there. Uh, that being said, F. Joe Cronin, play the diss track. I'm out. <laughs> this one goes out to Joe Cronin. He is an ugly bald-headed hoe who don't know shit, won't pick up the phone, so I'll tell you how it's going. First off, get your head out your ass, and if you think you keeping Dame, ha ha ha, I'ma laugh. It was a couple years back, he said he's loyal for life, but you're a liar, he's tired, and in his back is your knife. You think you winning and swindling with the heat. You got for fetish, you always end in defeat. If you lord of the flies, then Pat is lord of the fleas. But you still think you woody with Andy down at your feet. You haven't heard, Andy Ellisberg will not be deferred. You like verb, haven't said a word, phone on don't disturb. You absurd, Portland kicks you to the curb. It's deserved for finishing third when the three-team trade for Dame confirmed. Pat take his nuts, dragging balls on your face. Kamehameha, kids is here to stay. You give us Dame, but we also keeping yo bitch. And if Pat wanted to, he also would take yo bitch. Slip back his hair, that's something you cannot do. And then pipe your girl in his Armani suit. The next day, she'll beg for Pat back, and he will not show up. He went balls deep and left, just like he tongue over Iloa. 
Cronin, I'm candid, I'll tell you I can see your future is grim like in Billy and Mandy If you do dang dirty like Dirty Dan Sandy Who's sleeping like Pat, now I'll pass it to Andy I got a problem with you, here's the matter, dude I'm kinda mad at you, I'm mad at you Because your attitude is getting rather rude Show gratitude to Dame cause you never made it Seems better, his too long as ten Your teammates are Harkless and Myers Leonard Who are bums Yes, Heat fans know that they both suck Tell me, Joe Cronin, what is it you want? You said now is winning time, but you want all the picks. I wish you'd make up your mind instead of making me sick. Where the hell you at, Joe? Where you at? Where the hell you at, Joe? Where you at? Where the hell you at, Joe? Where you at? Where the hell you at, Joe? Where you at? Where the hell you at, Joe? Where the hell you at? Where the hell you at, Joe? Where the hell you at? Where the hell you at, Joe? Where the hell you at? Where you at, Joe? Where the fuck are you at, man? This song sucks. I mean, this guy gotta get a life, bro. I mean, what is he even doing with it?